Okay, let's get started with our first presentation for the section of resource <clears throat> recovery. This presentation is a case of a study improving plant performance by eliminating side stream phosphorus loads and is presented by Nathan Brown. Mr. Brown is a principal process mechanical engineer with 18 years of experience uh, delivering grand, uh, greenfield and retrofitting upgrade to municipal and industrial water resources recovery facilities. His technical expertise includes mainstream and side stream nutrient removal and recovery, process modeling, aeration and blower design, and biosolids treatment. Nate serves as a design manager for the MacPress upgrade uh, case study in Denver, Colorado. Uh, he works for Estante. Morning, everyone. Last two sessions of the day. Thanks for uh, sticking it out. Sticking it out with me. As mentioned, I'm going to be covering a case study that occurred in Denver, Colorado. This is the implementation of a side stream phosphorus management facility, and then we'll be discussing uh, the design, construction. The performance to date and lessons learned from the project. Um, in terms of agenda, we'll go through the background studies, uh, the business case that followed the studies, uh, and then design, construction, performance. Starting off with the background, uh, it's important to understand the height facility. So this, as you see here, this is a photograph of the Robert W. Height facility. It's a 220 MGD rated facility uh, located in the heart of Denver. Um, the process is pretty interesting. The plant is divided into two pretty much equal size capacity trains. There's a north secondary process that's got an MLE configuration with a side stream bio P configuration. On the south and blue there is a, is a south complex about the same size again. That's an A2O facility with the flexibility to run as an MLE. Uh, Biosolids is smack dab in the middle there with gravity thickeners for primary sludge thickening, DAF, uh, mesophilic anaerobic digestion, two phase acid phase and uh, gas phase. And there's also side stream demodification. This facility seen in red. And interestingly, they uh, also disinfect with parasitic acid. I'm listing some of the drivers there you can see. Effluent quality, I'll get into that in more detail on the next slide. Um, there's a lot of growth happening in Denver and in Colorado's front range in general, that's a big driver for the facility. Uh, it's a very tight site as you can see here. It's pretty much constrained on all sides by rivers and power plants. There is a little bit of real estate off to, uh, I think, your right, uh, your left, rather, sorry. It's uh, maybe for a future tertiary facility, but it's a pretty small footprint. Um, as with most bigger, older facilities, this is an aging facility with aging assets, and there is a strong sustainability driver in Denver. The nutrient roadmap in Colorado is what kind of set this entire thing into play here. So I won't go through all the detail of this, but the important thing is essentially the state has set up a pathway to get to extremely tight nitrogen and phosphorus limits. So you can see those, I think, on your far right there. Total nitrogen at two and total phosphorus of 0.1. That's some time off into the road. The state did a pretty interesting thing with incentivizing utilities to start knocking down nutrients early. So you see in the middle there around phase two, that's a volunteer incentive program with TIN of seven, total phosphorus 0.7. And that, that volunteer incentive program will be important in a minute. We can talk about the construction schedule and design schedule of the project. Big picture, nutrients are going to be going away in Colorado. And uh, specifically, this, this uh, talk today is mainly around the phosphorus element. So looking at those nutrient limits and up against the drivers that they were, they were the Metro uh, Water Recovery um, uh, Utility developed this pretty neat infographic here on the right-hand side. Um, pretty comprehensive. It was a great internal document to get people involved and engaged. The item I want to highlight and point out there is, has been uh, expanded for you. What that graph shows from kind of green to yellow to orange is essentially the incremental cost per pound of phosphorus removed to go from 90, 95% or so to 99.9% .9 to get down to that 0.1 limit in the future. So what you can see here is at $3,000 uh, per pound of nitrogen, this is a massively expensive project. So upon seeing this, um, the district the utility wanted to go out and make sure they could uh, right size future tertiary facilities. That future $3,000 per pound number 
that's based on uh, future flock set basins, conservatively sized or not efficient bio P, those kind of things. So the project, all the projects leading up to that future tertiary is to made to right size, minimize those upgrades and the cost of them. Um, along the way in this phosphorus, uh, phosphorus initiative on the left-hand side here, you can see a whole long list of items, studies that were, that were uh, set up and then tackled. Some of these are ongoing, some of them are pending. A couple of interesting bits uh, that came out of this work is on the right-hand side. Uh, so we were fortunate enough to work with the utility to uh, pilot uh, densified activated sludge in the indents uh, hydrocyclone process. And uh, long story short on that, um, essentially district is estimating they can get about 30% or more additional capacity. And they can get that by loading their clarifiers more heavily. So you see here the little chart kind of in the top middle, that's some SVI results. So we're looking at 40 to 60 um, uh, improvement milliliters per gram with the uh, S, uh, indents, sorry, uh, improvements. On the bottom, there's deammonification shown. How is that related to, to phosphorus? There are a bunch of side stream phosphorus, oh, sorry, side stream nitrogen reactors at the facility. And by implementing deammonification in one of those, we were able to uh, basically open up uh, existing basins uh, that were currently being used for side stream nitrogen. We we're able to repurpose those for side stream phosphorus. So then on the lower right, you're seeing uh, the side stream EVPR configuration I mentioned earlier that uses an anaerobic reactor on RAS, on RAS so that the footprint can shrink. And then the food source uh, is important because it's not mainstream. You don't have influent carbon there. So they use gravity thickener effluent, which had adequate BFA and RBCOD to drive that P release in the side stream. Advantage of that, again, is just to have tighter footprint and maximize use of existing basins. Now I'll talk about uh, once you're running BioP, what happens if it's unmitigated, meaning you, you, um, the, the phosphorus returns are allowed to come back to the front of the plant. What you see here is kind of a Sankey diagram looking figure. It's overlaid on a typical wastewater plant. The thickness of the lines is really meant to represent kind of the, the load of phosphorus, if you will. Blue is phosphorus in water, brown is phosphorus in the sludge, and orange is just representing where struvite can pop out of the system. So as you imagine, a lot of phosphorus is coming in. We do BioP, great BioP, send as much of that as possible to the digesters. Of course, in an anaerobic digester, you release that phosphorus again, right? And that's the big problem there. So left unmitigated, you can have you know, one to 2% of your uh, flow in your side stream. You can have 20 to 25% of your phosphorus load. So this is obviously a very advantageous place to jump in and try to do something. Uh, the unintended consequences of biological phosphorus removal, if left unmitigated. There's three of them here I wanna discuss. There's more than this, but I'm trying to keep it a little short. Um, in terms of dewaterability, this is some data from a long time ago when they first started up the South Secondary process. They could run that as BioP plants. So it was about 40% of the load at the time. And you can see right as the BioP happened, the dewaterability, the, the red dots jumped off a, a pretty steep cliff there. My understanding is other, other inputs, polymer, there were left the same. And, and it showed definitely a negative response. In addition to that, there's dewatering concerns. There's struvite formation that I think a number of utilities are all too familiar with. That leads to increased maintenance, um, decreases your digestion capacity, causes things to go offline. Just a major maintenance headache for plant staff. And then finally, the effluent quality. By not mitigating that return, if there's not quite enough carbon in the influent, you're going to see an elevated bio, uh, sorry, elevated uh, phosphate in your effluent. And the only way to really mitigate that then is to use PCP. And comparing ChemP, say ferric, to, to some kind of phosphorus management solution, ChemP definitely on an O&M basis is a much, much more costly uh, endeavor. So I'll go into the studies. So at the time, so again, this started early, early 2010s. Um, the whole plant impacts of side stream phosphorus management were not known at the time. There wasn't that much. There was some information out in the market, but it wasn't, there wasn't a ton of it. So the uh, utility decided to embark upon uh, a bunch of pilot studies, desktop studies to try to inform themselves. The ultimate goal of all this is there's gonna be a business case evaluation looking at kind of the do nothing ferric chloride, if you will. They already had that system on site and then two different technologies to manage side stream phosphorus. Um, yeah, so the, early on, um, uh, Ostara was piloted and performed very well. After that, there was a bunch of uh, you know, sampling across the plant and the whole plant 
bio and model was developed, try to understand how the facility was performing better. Um, there were also a lot of interest in releasing phosphorus out of the WAS with the, with the WAS strip process. So the, uh, the utility was doing a number of those trial studies as well. Magprex, the time it was called Airprex, was on the scene and was piloted then. And then right after that, the boxes in black there, that's kind of where we got involved. R1280 was the name of our project. We started in evaluating things, got our hands in the digital twin and upgraded it um, and made it work for our purposes. And also as part of that, we actually uh, set up a couple of digesters, pilot digesters, where we had a control, had dewatering facilities after that. And then we had a digester that we were doing uh, the WAS phosphorus stripping on as well. And we were looking at the dewater abilities. They're taking real data, and then those results were getting plugged into our economic model. So we really compared two alternatives here. So there's pre dewatering sequestration and recovery. So that's the, the Airprex or Magprex system, as it's called now. And then we were comparing that to WAS phosphate stripping and centrate recovery or the Ostara WAS strip process. So a lot of work involved with this. Plenty of fun doing all that work, um, but it kind of boiled down to this chart right here. So I do want to spend a little time on it. The two value, uh, the two uh, technologies are listed on the top here, and we kind of can go through a few of the findings in terms of managing the recycle control. It was uh, determined that maybe the bagprex system was a little more simple to operate than all the things associated with the uh, wild strip. So that was given a better grade. Based on the piloting, there was better polymer reduction with uh, the uh, MAGPREX process. Uh, in terms of truck haulage, those numbers are pretty much the same. Um, there was lesser, with, with the, the pre-dewatering sequestration option, there was lesser improvement to the digesters. So we used the bio and model and some models like MinTech to try to predict how much struvite we might have, the two cases. In this case, so the, the, uh, the Ostara WAS strip definitely performed better with more reduction expected in the digester. And in the economic model, we tried to apply costs to those digestion cleaning uh, needs. In terms of dewatering, oh, there's a significant, um, uh, we, we evaluated the phosphate index for both options, look what it would do with the phosphorus and the biosolids. There was really no discernible difference. The two options, a lot of phosphorus um, was gonna be, man it would just, it all, it all ended up being the same, I guess, in the effluent and in the cake. Um, in terms of product recovery, this is an interesting one. At the time, we assumed the pre dewatering option would get us about 20% recovery. Uh, and with the, with the OSTAR option, it's much higher than that. In the economic model, we actually didn't apply any cost or any value economic return on any struvite recovered with that process because we weren't sure if the markets were going to take it. There wasn't going to be a, a guaranteed offtake agreement with that material. Um, in terms of complexity and return on investment, then, I think I mentioned this before, but the, the pre-dewatering option was looked as more simple as fewer bells and whistles uh, compared to the alternative. Then we did a return on investment evaluation as well. And that showed a pretty clear difference, about a nine year return on investment versus 17 for the other alternative. So at that point, it was decided to proceed with the MAGPREX process. And I'll cover some of the interesting bits of design here, hopefully. This is the complete view of the system components. It looks a little more complex than it really is. So I'm gonna step through it just one at a time here. So the blue that I've highlighted now, that's just the flows coming in and out. Redundant pipelines coming into a new pump to feed the reactor and then gravity flow and overflow um, to get to a downstream sludge holding tank. Um, the, the height facility is interesting in that it's got pre-digestion uh, sludge holding tank storage and post-digestion sludge holding tank storage. And so we were basically pumping out of those sludge holding tanks through the reactor and then sending them back before it would get kicked onto dewatering. Air is required in this process. Uh, air mixes and suspends the mixed liquor and the, the struvite that forms, but it also strips the pH. Oh, sorry, strips the CO2 and elevates the pH. Elevating the pH is what causes the struvite to occur. The chemical systems are now highlighted in yellow. Mag chloride, um, the high facility receives a rail delivery. So I had some fun working with the rail and modifying some existing chemical storage for ferric to make it work for mag chloride as well. We also included anti-foam. This was recommended by the supplier. The thought being if your digesters are foaming, you send it to a downstream reactor that you're aerating, you're gonna have foam occur there. My understanding, and all that was provided was a little IBC coat. My understanding that they've not yet had to use that anti-foam system at all. So it just sits there empty, I think. 
Moving on to the pumping systems. So struvite in this reactor is supposed to settle to the bottom. And so down at the bottom, there is a progressing cavity pump. A lot of bells and whistles around this. The main takeaways here are flushing, access for cleaning. You know, this is, if plugging is gonna occur and things are gonna happen, this is where you're gonna want the most maintenance. So there are a lot of provisions provided for that. There was also a, a recycle we provided. So if you capture these particles, you can pump them back into the reactor. The thought there is that maybe we can grow bigger crystals and recover more. So that's something that I think Metro is still working on right now, trying to uh, optimize that recycle system. And then lastly, there's a recovery system. This is essentially a, uh, a Huber Coanda grit, uh, grit classifier system that's been repurposed a little bit for struvite. And then downstream of that's a well. Uh, the site constraints, the site was quite tight here. Um, as I showed you earlier, not a lot of space. And we also wanted to be right next to those sludge holding tanks, right? That's where our sludge was coming from and going right back to. So we did not have a lot of options. So we picked this, the spot there shown kind of in a black highlight, a whole bunch of stuff around it. To make it more fun, we had a really large duct bank running right through the middle of this. So we had, you know, slab uh, foundations to deal with, tons of potholing, and then massive piers in the ground under the four support reactors. So we had to coordinate all that. It was, it was a good time. To make it more fun, we had a bunch of interceptors running around this facility. So three smaller interceptors shown there kind of in bright red, darker red. There was a massive 60 inch interceptor that uh, went under our building. That's the part of the building is actually our phosphorus loadout, Truvite, sorry, loadout facilities. So we had to do a lot of work to make sure we weren't gonna damage the integrity of that line. And then there's a corridor kind of in the up down direction with all sorts of small facilities. So it's pretty tight. Um, as we got into this, we realized we're gonna have a whole lot of pipes running back and forth into that sludge holding tank complex. And they were gonna be super buried. Jason, <laughs> Jason helped with the design on that. <laughs> um, the, the tons of buried uh, utilities. We were concerned about potential for struvite replacement. So it was decided to actually build an underground tunnel there to connect those two structures together and to provide access to all this pipeline. And then on top of that, we placed a stair tower. So the stair tower is how you get up there. It's also how all the process flows got up there, airflow. Got to the top of the reactor. There was very little room for construction lay down. So the contractor just kind of had that little yellow bit there. And then way across the site, they had a much bigger area. So it was very constrained um, throughout, uh, throughout design and construction, tough, tough uh, site. In terms of the implementation schedule, as we were going through this and learning more about the underground utilities that were now gonna be in a tunnel, we started to realize that we had a bunch of work to do and a bunch of utilities to relocate below ground that was gonna push out our schedule immensely because that work had to be done before we built up. So at that point, we decided to split the project into three work packages. Um, putting one project into three packages is probably the hardest part of this project for me anyway, as the, as the design manager. Um, uh, work package zero, we called it. That was the PO to CNP. So that PO was for equipment procurement. And it was also to get them engaged with us to design the reactor and all the coordination needed there. But the reactor was not purchased at the time. Materials, the erection, the fabrication was not procured. The price for those things was set, but that was held. Work package one, Arch Archer Western constructed that. That was the below ground tunnel improvement project. So that took a while. And then work package two, PTL construction got that. That was the balance of the plant. In that CNP was engaged through ECL to fabricate, coat, build, start up the reactor. So it was a pretty interesting delivery approach. And on the bottom there, you can kind of see the workflow that happened. I won't go through all that, but essentially I think we estimated at the time by doing this revised approach, it saved about 18 months out of the project schedule, 12 to 18 months. So it was pretty significant. Moving on to construction, some photos of a pretty massive reactor here. Um, I'd like to bring up at this time coatings. Coatings was a big issue with this project, right? This is such a massive facility. Right away, we got an independent coating expert involved to, to review and monitor everything. That uh, proved to be absolutely crucial and beneficial to the job um, and would highly recommend it if you're looking at coating something this large. Oop, oh no, it's gonna script the videos. This is my first time trying to do videos and have it work. Let's see if it works, all right? So there are a couple of major picks that happened in this. First, they built this massive cone. I think it weighed about 110, 110,000 pounds. So in the video that's running right now, we're gonna see that thing be flipped over. I think it was a pretty great day on site. 
and then placed on top of the data. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, I was overseas doing some work with Stantec, and I missed all that. So I, they sent me videos. So that was nice. And the second video here, this is showing the second pick. So this is to pick the large reactor up and throw it on top of the building, the other reactor. It was a 600 ton crane, pretty massive. Again, trying to find a place to set the crane and support it was, was pretty complex. And there was a heck of a lot of counterweight on that as well. Pretty neat stuff though. One of the takeaways I think from this is that the manufacturers who sell this equipment now have kind of standardized on smaller reactors, I think 14 foot diameter, given heights. So these things are going to be fabricated, and I understand, I think, coded and brought to site. So there's not going to be all this on-site fabrication that we saw here. I think that really drives some efficiency in this type of process in the future. In terms of reactor construction, I just have some shots of the inside. Um, I have some of these annotated on the right here. Um, there were some upper diffusers. There's upper and a lower grid. I think we found that that upper diffuser grid doesn't provide a lot of benefit and it's not being run very much. That lower diffuser grid is providing all the work we need to suspend and strip the pH. We also added, it's probably pretty hard to see, but we also added a removable walkway down at the bottom. We wanted a walkway to get to those lower diffusers because that's where the bulk of the air was coming from. But then we were like troubled with, well, crap, we just put a walkway in and we're gonna have stuff settling on it, getting stuck to it, it's gonna be massive weight. So it's a, it's a removable system. Um, and my understanding is that uh, Metro hires an outside contractor to come in on it. Uh, some supporting equipment, um, upper, uh, upper uh, left here, aeration blowers. These are, this is a really, really deep tank. So we use the Delta hybrid uh, airs and blowers, which are good for deeper for tanks, higher pressures, and they have great efficiency and turn down. Uh, bottom left, you can see the struvite pumps. There's a lot of space around that. You can kind of see coming in at angles, all the reactor legs, all this equipment was kind of fit under and around the reactor. And then just a couple shots of the stair tower there. Feed sludge lines, feed air lines, return lines, those kind of things. Getting to performance. Um, let's look at the chart on the left here first. So this is the orthophosphate conversion efficiency. And as you can see, once this thing was started up, started up in late, uh, I think November 2020, was when uh, it was you know finally filled with sludge and started running. So this this data starts right after that, I guess. But you can see here, great great orth orthophosphate conversion occurring within the reactor. And the chart on the right, um, you can see that there was a period when the reactor was offline for some maintenance. And you can see that ortho P, the, uh, I think they're in purple, uh, that ortho P and the centrate just shot up while that reactor was offline. Reactor brought back online, the ortho phosphate jumped right back down to where it was. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's just a little more data on, uh, you know, the uh, up and downstream of the Magprex reactor upstream, you can see that uh, for this data set anyway, it was 334 was the average total phosphorus and coming out for the centrate was 17. So about a 95% reduction. On the bottom here, this is uh, some shots inside of some of the centrate pumps and piping on the site. And you know, over a period of three months, you know, basically what these photos show is there wasn't really any noticeable struvite buildup at all. Prior to this, without the reactor in operation, system in operation, uh, my understanding is the centrate lines plugged rapidly, required jetting all the time. They have redundant lines, shut one down, jet the other one, and go back and forth. So on the centrate side, uh, the struvite has been cut down immensely in pipeline. So what does this do to effluent quality, right? That's what it's all about. So, um, you know, again, it's a complicated plant, north train and a south train. They can run them differently. They can run, sent, they can send centrate to different ones. So it's a bit hard to explain it all in a short amount of time. But I think proof in the pudding here is just the, these charts, you know, the median information's on the left-hand side for the north, uh, uh, the northern treatment plant, northern complex, sorry. That was run in BioP in 2019. And you can see just great, great BioP results. Um, similarly on the north, on the south plant, sorry, they weren't running in BioP till later. But that last data point there, kind of in green, you can see that they've got uh, they've got the phosphorus on both plants now well under control. And what's really interesting about this, I think, is that you know there's the median data, but then there's also the 95th percentile data, and that 95th percentile data doesn't doesn't really at all. So it's showing that it's a pretty stable process. In terms of dewatering performance, um, one of the, again one of the benefits that, that was. Uh, 
that was given to Magprex during the evaluation phase was that it was going to really reduce the amount of, of polymer. Polymer was a huge issue for them. The metro facility, they, they own a bunch of farms about 100, 120 miles uh, east of Denver. So it's about a 200 mile round trip to dispose of biosolids. Massively costly for them. Um, in addition to those costs, polymer costs were really, really significant as well. What this shows from the dark to the light blue is that in full scale, we're seeing about a 22.5% reduction in polymer. And the cake solids is then shown on the right. You can see those are about the same. So what Metro has found is that for their sweet spot for cake percent solids, their, their most efficient place to operate is between 21, 21 and a half total solids. So they don't try to maximize it all out. I think that limits has issues with their trucking system. So 21, 21 and a half is right where they want to be. Uh, in terms of struvite recovery performance. So, um, you know, this is on digested sludge. So, um, you know, it's not a class A product. Some of the other items coming right out of the reactor. Uh, we did some pilot testing early on to prove that, yeah, over just some simple air drying, just spreading it out in a covered area, it got to class A pretty quickly. In the full scale, that's been proven out as well. The struvite, they do recover, they air dry it. Um, in a big, big warehouse looking thing. Uh, they meet class A with all of it. Product that they're recovering, they're just giving it right now to a local composter. That composter is making kind of like a high phosphate compost, selling it at a premium, I suppose. Um, and right now, they're, again, Metro's not recovering any value from that. I think they're just giving it away. I think part of the reason is the recovery hasn't quite been where we had all hoped. Um, you know, this is a large reactor, super deep. It's definitely one of a kind in the world. Um, and I think there's a number of optimizations figured out with this system to really try to maximize recovery. Some of the other installations, like Amsterdam, Germany, they've gotten higher recovery numbers and, and Metro hasn't quite got there. So there's a lot of ongoing interest and work to optimize that in my understanding. I think they're presenting at WefTech in a month and I think they've got, this data is about a year old. So I think uh, over the last year, they've made some improvements and even very recently have made some more. So, uh, look, look them up at WebTech if you want to learn more about how that's, that's running. Well, on the maintenance side, so here are some shots inside the reactor after it's been running. Those soak in for a second. Picture in the bottom middle is pretty fun. So uh, when in, in the study phase of this, we were anticipating a two-week shutdown once a year for these reactors, uh, for this reactor, sorry. Um, and thus far, the maintenance has been more than planned. Um, the main reason has been in the primary sludge. We knew this going into the project. There's, there's a, they got a three eighths inch, I think, bar screen at the front of the plant, and they got an eighth inch bar screen on their primary sludge. And I think it's, it's kind of well understood that, that that primary sludge bar screen doesn't do a heck of a lot. So a lot of rags, uh, ragging issues in their digesters and their piping and in their pumps. And those translated down to Magprex as well. So. We used like a, like a Sanitaire D24 style wideband diffuser because we just had so much air to put in and we didn't want to have a million diffusers in there. So that was good. But the negative is, is that those diffusers just kind of hang out there, right? And provide a great place for material to wrap themselves around. So as you can see in that bottom middle there, there's a lot of rag and debris on that. Now it's hard to know exactly if it was like that when it was running or when they drained the thing, if a bunch of crap settled on it, it's hard to say, but it's not great. Um, but well, what they've done to manage this now is uh, during a recent uh, maintenance event, I think it occurred about six months ago, they went back in there with the supplier of the diffusers and they kind of reinforced those. We had some diffusers that fell off due to some of these weights on there and it got caught up in our struvite pump, kind of kind of submarine the project, if you will, or just made them take it offline sooner than they expected. So took it offline, got that diffuser out. They reinforced those diffusers, um, and reconfigured them a little bit. They've had really good success since that happened without having any, finding any rubite pump. Um, I think I covered it all. In terms of the struvite buildup, you can kind of see it in the lower right-hand corner and you can see it in the other sheets, uh, the other, other images rather, on the walls. Um, that struvite was found to be pretty easy to get rid of, just power wash it and it falls right off. Not a, not a massive issue. It will be interesting to see now with, uh, with the diffuser, made, diffuser improvements that were made, if the maintenance, if the frequency between shutdowns is extended, we're trying to get out to that once a year as originally planned. Uh, and then I'm pretty much wrapped up here. I just want to go through maybe some, some lessons learned and some consideration for some future work. 
So out of this, let's uh, let's look at screening first of all. So uh, you know, uh, Metro is looking to improve their either their influence screen, but I think more likely they'll maybe go to some kind of sludge screen type application to get those rags out. Um, since this project happened, some of the suppliers now are recommending or requiring that we have a quarter inch perf plate for these applications at the front end of the plant. Or conversely, you could use a strain press sludge screen, and and that that should really help remove those rags and cut down on that maintenance activity. Uh, reactor redundancy. During design, there was a lot of discussion of one versus two reactor, and, and it went on for quite a while. At the end of the day, we opted to go for one larger reactor because it kind of just optimized that really tight site we had. You know, if budget, because there's more budget to building, more budget required to building more reactors, but you know, if more budget, if you have more budget and more space um, than we had, you know, I would definitely consider two reactors, maybe two at 60% capacity, two at 50, something like that. That way, when you're taking one down for maintenance, Maybe your HRT and the other one is a little low. It's not doing 95% conversion, but you're getting something out of it. The impact of the plant is going to happen. Um, and so I think in hindsight, we would have all liked to see two reactors on the site. It just didn't, didn't really work out with the cards we had to play. In terms of reactor materials, you know, again, I mentioned the coding issues. This is, these are massive reactors with smaller reactors. That's maybe going to get easier for you. But I would also encourage you to look at stainless steel as well. I'm working on a project right now in Greeley, and we're, we're carrying forward stainless steel and working with the contractor and the vendors. Um, we're seeing carbon steel plus coating being pretty close to stainless steel. You know, I, with, with all the interesting stuff going on in commodity prices, that, that may not be the case anymore. But a few months ago, when we did a cost evaluation. That's kind of where we ended up. Uh, in terms of pipeline maintenance, um, you know, this reactor definitely is. Systems like this will definitely reduce struvite and all these pipes as I've shown, but they're still going to be present. They're still going to they're still going to pop up from time to time. So definitely things like redundant pipelines. Think about your pipeline materials, flushing, jetting, cleanouts, kind of everywhere, pretty much. Instead of a ninety, put a T. Instead of a three way, put a put a cross. You know things like that. Um, and we were for our project, we were definitely concerned about on the upstream side before we'd manage the struvite. We had some redundancy in the downstream and some cleanouts, but in hindsight, there has been more struvite on those pumps and pipes downstream. The pipes, there's no pumps, there, sorry, from those pipelines. Those pipes are finding those, the effluent are getting fouled with struvite still pretty quickly. So there's more maintenance than we anticipated on the downstream side of the unit. And then lastly, just a touch on recovery. Um, so, I mean, right now, based on what we've been able to see, you know, it's not easy to recover this product. Maybe some of the, some of the newer installations that come online with multiple reactors will have better success. But you know, it's one thing to consider if, if your driver is not to recover a product and have it for sale or for, for kind of public outreach, then maybe consider foregoing that. You don't really need that system. Any struvite that settles in the bottom of your reactor, you can just pump right back into your sludge, send it onto your dewatering centrifuge, and it's all going to get taken out. So for the, uh, the image shown on the right here, this is a project I'm working on right now in Colorado and Greeley. Um, and we are, we've eliminated the building. So you saw for, the, for our application at Metro, we had a large building to hold all the supporting equipment. And that was our plan for Greeley. Um, once we got into it though, there's a number of buildings around there. And we're kind of like, well, what if you can put a couple pumps here, a blower there, an anti-foam there. And we kind of teased that out over the course of a couple of weeks. And that's how we're proceeding now with design. So the only operating equipment around the reactor is just a single struvite pump below it. Uh, it's going to be kind of in a little heated enclosure. And I think with that, I can't click forward, but with that, it, that, was, that was the end. Oh, there we go. Um, and it, I, I just want to shout out to these three folks at, at Metro. Uh, they provided me some of this data. Again, they got better, more interesting data they're going to show at WEFTEC, but I was really thankful they provided me with what they did and let me talk to you today about some of the issues we've had. So, with the ragging and the diffusers. Um, their, their contact info is there. If you guys need for any reason or want to reach out to them, go ahead and jot that stuff down. And with that, I'm, I'm done. I'll take any questions. Any questions? Uh, just curious, chemically speaking, what was the reason for the polymer dosage to be reduced by 22 and a half percent for the biosolids yeah good question um 
I, I definitely am not a PhD in this, but I mean, I think there's a couple leading theories out there about why dewatering performance decreases with uh, BioP. There's a divalent cat, uh, divalent, I had a slide for it. Uh, uh, divalent theory, bridging theory, basically BioP causes the sludge to hold more water and make it more difficult to get rid of. So I think with doing the magnesium addition causes some ionic exchanges that, that allows that water to move out more freely. So I think that's one of the leading uh, theories on why there's a degradation of BioP. Thank you. Now it's live stream, so please use the microphone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so we were obviously pretty concerned about, you know, uh, traditional consulting engineers. I don't think we generally have a lot of like NACE certified, you know, folks on our staff. So what we did was we, we didn't have any local to us at our, at our disposal at that time within the firm. So we reached out to an external uh, company that we got some references on. We got, we talked to two or three firms. One of the gentlemen just, uh, um, uh, definitely seemed a level above the rest and his pricing was in line with everyone else. So he was contracted directly through Metro Utility um, as a kind of an independent sub to them. Answer your question? Any other questions? I do have one. Do you have sludge grinders um, upstream of the reactors? Um, that is a good question. Uh, there are definitely sludge grinders um, on the primary sludge, and there might be some downstream of that. I, it's been five or six years since I've walked. I know there are sludge grinders, but I don't think the sludge grind, the presence of sludge grinders has, doesn't seem to help with the rags. It's kind of my understanding that these fibers, even if they get ground up, they kind of recoalesce, stick together in digesters and whatnot. So um, I'm not sure that a sludge grinder is going to solve the ragging, but it's, it, it's a good question. Okay, thank you. 